Um, all right, so this section of the class, we are talking about the political virtues, which is the art, statecraft is the art of creating a middle class. And you need to do that, first of all, by training children to want to live moderately, not to want to get rich and use the whole system to wrap it around their fingers so they can have money and walk away from everybody else. You have to teach citizens not to want that. And you have to teach them from when they're young. You have to teach by example, show them. Middle-class life is best because then you can play with your friends and you don't worry about if they're rich or poor. They're just your friends because kids don't care, really. Um, anyway, so we have weaving them together in terms of the regulations of the marketplace. How do you create interdependencies, cooperative relationships between the workers and the owners so that they mutually support each other. Um, how do you make laws that, um, okay, so the art of legislation is knowing how to make these laws, how to distribute money or how to distribute social goods like education, healthcare, transportation, uh, parks, recreation, all of that stuff is how do you allocate resources? Um, you want people to develop their talents. You want to provide opportunities for that. And AUW and Lion both provide opportunities for students who were talented, but they didn't have the economic resources. So, uh, so the legislature, okay, there's some private donors, but they also get tax breaks for doing that. So that's a political issue. Uh, when donors donate money, then they don't have to pay taxes or they pay lower taxes on those donations. So that's another way that the political system, the economic system work together to try and maximize the capabilities of citizens. And that can happen within a nation, in a local area or internationally. Um, punishing wrongs, okay? So we have an international court in Geneva, we have um, regional courts, I, I assume. And then there's national courts and there's local courts. So when somebody breaks the law, how do you, how do you uh, deter other people, right? How do you create a system where people will not want to break the law and the punishments will be severe enough that they wouldn't want to, but it's, but also that once they get incarcerated, there the goal should be rehabilitation, some way to cultivate capabilities so that when they get out, they have a way to have a job and they're not just left on the street. So that would be uh, punishing with a view to, um, to prevent them from coming back, to enable them to flourish. Then a judge knowing how to apply the laws. And then in practical cases, every decision, like criminal justice cases. And if you think about it, in your countries, I assume the newspaper will cover uh, what the politicians are doing in terms of the criminal justice system, the distribution of wealth and resources, and citizens talk to each other about it, right? Um, it, are there political leaders ruling for the sake of the ruled? Are they just helping their friends and harming their enemies? All that sort of stuff. Now, other capabilities. These are the ones that you associate with school. Um, this is technical school, you know, making shoes or something to sell. Um, but the intellectual virtues are the math, science, um, and any sort of discipline that you learn, social science, you learn the methodology, you learn how to do it, and um, then you apply it. So 
So those are, so now we're gonna focus on the political virtues. And um, let me go to, um, the, this is about management, right? How to exercise virtue when you are a manager. This can be in any kind of administration. It can be somebody running a school, like a principal. It can be somebody, uh, you know, political leader. It can be somebody running a hospital. It can be somebody running a corporation, obviously. But it's not just the business sector. Every sector of society has um, a structure. And always there is a disparity between the employer and the employees. Or within a big company, there's a whole management uh, hierarchy. But at every step of the way, a good manager, a good boss, Hat should have their power for some reason, like they've proven that they're good at it, and that's why they got promoted. To be good at it means that you use the authority you have to rule for the benefit of the ruled. So if you're really a good manager, your employees have opportunities to educate themselves and also they have opportunities to start doing what you're doing. So you basically could replace yourself. That would be a really good manager because they're educating people. They're helping people help themselves. So a good manager would sort of manage themselves out of a job, right? And make other people more equal because when people are more equal, they can deliberate better. They can have better debates about what should we do next. Everybody will have a, an informed opinion, um, but that should be the same with a political leader, right? One of the characteristics of a good political leader is they can educate citizens. They can explain why they did what they did. And so citizens become Inform not only told what the ruler did, but they explain why. And so this, so then next time around or over time, a citizen can check and see, okay, well, that was a good reason. Did it work? Well, yeah, it did work. Well, why did it work? Did it work for that reason or some other reason? Or did it not work? Um, or did it turn out, but it was, it was, the decision was made for the wrong reason. And, and human affairs, political affairs are extremely complicated. And people debate about this stuff all the time. So even a decision that was made, not only with good intentions, but informed experts were involved and they were consulted it can have unintended consequences. And so then you look back and say, could we have predicted these consequences? Now, what's happened lately, of course, with COVID is that a lot of great decisions were made about a lot of things and then COVID hit, right? And all of a sudden, oh my gosh, you know, what are we going to do next? And so the, the leaders that are going to be able to be successful. And one of those articles about change makers is about this. So the people who are gonna be able to succeed are the ones that don't just obey rules and regulations and don't just set up rules and tell people to do it because the rules say so. Those companies and those workers aren't gonna make it. The ones who are going to succeed are the ones who start recognizing patterns, who start uh, self-correcting, who start explaining to themselves and each other the broader picture, like what they're anticipating and why. What, in other words, 
pretty much what I'm teaching you is what that article says is what's really gonna be valued in the future is pattern recognition. Well, the whole Greek culture is based on our capacity for pattern recognition. And um, Greek tragedy, Greek poetry, Homer, Plato, those are all about patterns in human affairs. And so a training to recognize patterns in human affairs is going to suit people well as we move forward. Um, so that's another reason why I have you um, learning. I mean, the way I teach Islamic humanism, Christian humanism, Hindu humanism, is that you can see the patterns and then just get in the habit of looking for patterns. Now, why is it that people fail? There's so many reasons people fail to do what's best. They don't have the skills, they're ignorant, or they're cynical. And this is the big problem, is that when people believe that the goal is wealth, power, or honor, not wisdom or justice. So in order to preserve uh, a stable society, people have to be able to identify if a leader is cynical and manipulating them. And the article we had last time was about the American founders worried because they wanted the citizens to be educated enough to know when these political leaders are manipulating them and being cynical and using them for their own purposes, covering it up with rhetoric. So <clears throat> it is important to know that. Um, so the leaders, so I, I made a distinction between a leader who keeps the vision of the company in mind um, and maintains trust and goodwill. So uh, a company has to make money, but that, that shouldn't be their primary goal. Their primary goal would be to be a contributor to the community, right? They provide jobs, they provide economic stimulation, and they also want to work with other people in the community so that the they want their employees, if they really want to have a productive employee network, right, employees, those employees have to live in environments that are safe. They have to have, their children have to have a good education. They have to have a good transportation network. I mean, all these things that are socialist that the government has to pay for is something that an employer would want, right? They how can the worker get to work on time if there's no transportation or if they have to worry about their kids getting a bad education or there's a million things, but everything's connected. And so a really good business leader wants to just make their contribution, which is to provide the money. Uh, you know, money is necessary, just like food is necessary, but that doesn't mean your goal in life is food, right? But it's one of the things, right? We have to have money, but the goal is to just be a contributing member in the economic sector of society, but working with the education, political, recreational, you know, healthcare, all that other stuff. They would work with it. Um, so that would be the leader keeping that vision in mind of always working at this broader point of view. And then the manager is the one that sort of figures out, well, what specifically do we need to do to realize this goal? Um, so you, know, you have to have all these other virtues in order to be able to make these decisions. We learn through imitating others through role models, through conversation, and through education. So sometimes you read something and that, that helps you understand. Sometimes you have to talk to somebody. Sometimes you see other people doing things and they work or don't work. And so you imitate or don't imitate them. 
uh, continual self-monitoring. This is Greek. This is the self-examination. That's what Socrates did. Um, all right. So self-control, we talked about. Um, so I, I hope, again, that all of you brought the three points that you wanted to talk about. Um, and then while I'm talking, you just think of some other stuff, and then I'll put you into groups. Um, Self-control, how does that play out in a company? Well, the company would offer healthy food. Sometimes you work in places and all there is is junk food in the machines, right? Um, or you have the cafeteria and there really isn't anything healthy. I remember going to the cafeteria in the hospital at Batesville and it really, you really had to dig to find something I would consider very healthy. Um, then you could have exercise rooms, wellness programs, um, you, and you'd want a climate in your uh, company that doesn't undermine self-control, right? You don't want, uh, this one woman sued her company uh, actually, in the U.S., there are laws that you create an intimidating climate, okay? So you can create, so if you had a job where um, there were these big videos of, um, I don't know, strippers, right? <laughs> I mean, that would be an intimidating climate. This one girl, this one woman sued for intimidating climate because there were these uh, calendars, you know, with naked girls or almost naked girls. I, I don't think, I don't think she won. I don't know if she won, but you can go and complain. Oh, this other woman um, complained to her human resource person because every day her male colleague picked now, picked lint off of her blouse. Now, you have to think about this. That sounds really petty, except if you're a woman and some guy picks at your breasts every day, that would be an intimidating climate. So it's not really about the lint, you know? So anyway, I think, you know, a good leader wants employees that work together and don't do sort of sketchy little things like that. Um, then they would want to not to use sex to sell their products, try to use um, that buying the product is um, worth doing for some kind of meaningful goal. And I had a colleague who ran an advertising business and that was like the criteria for his clients. He worked with clients to, to figure out how you could match the product to something worthwhile. Um, all right, so research and development would try to be on products that are really promote human well being. Certainly, every company probably has some products that don't, but you know, if it sells, you can't go bankrupt. So you just have a, you have to weigh, make a judgment call about what percentage of your products, your advertising it has to be sketchy in order to survive. Um, okay. In general, if the company tries to maintain a higher level of operation, that the better employees will stay and the ones who who um, the better ones, or, yeah, will stay. Whereas if the company is just all about sex and money and power, um, the better employees will leave and then that's all you'll have left. And then if employees don't really respect their managers, their bosses, they don't respect what the company sells, they don't respect the advertising, but it's the only job they can get, of course, they're not gonna be very productive workers. They're not gonna be proactive. You're gonna to have to make them do whatever it is you want them to do. And it's a much, it's a lower level of 
interpersonal relationships. Um, then courage is a really big one. It takes a certain kind of person to be able to make decisions that affect people so much, right? They're in their basic ability to survive. Um, with, and they, they have to be conscientious, uh, they, but they have to have the courage to make, to take risks. That's why I could never be in any kind of managerial position because I would second guess myself. I, I just, I'm not good enough at just saying, this is how it's gonna, we're gonna do it. We'll learn from our mistakes, we'll move on. But definitely, you know, people have to do that. It's just that they really have to learn from their mistakes or else the person with power just says, just do it because I have the power to tell you to do it, you know? So this is a really difficult skill. Um, then because you can uh, take too many risks or you cannot take enough risks, um, if you are good at practical wisdom, you'll make a good judgment about it, but you can't be afraid that the employees are gonna complain, right? Because there's some employees that will always complain. That's just the way they deal with authority. Um, the, the leader has to try and explain to employees why, right? Because you wanna educate their minds. You don't want them just to blindly obey. But you just have to live with the fact that some will always complain and some will never complain. And you should encourage people to not to blindly obey, but to have reasons to talk to other people. Um, then the courage to admit your mistakes. Um, don't look for a scapegoat. Uh, explain why the company is, you know, um, in trouble. And I'm sure that this, that COVID has really tested leaders' abilities to do, to make good judgments. Hopefully they have come together and talked with their employees and um, developed a, a higher level of practical wisdom together, but there's bad stuff going on too about getting vaccinated and not getting vaccinated. So there's a lot of real problems going on in a lot of organizations in the US. Um, okay, the goal is to create trust. People trust the people around them and goodwill. Everyone really wants each other to do well and also to keep learning. So they develop more and more skills and they can move up any sort of ladder or they could get, they could start a new company or they could get a good job at another company because this company doing the job has been educational for them. Um, okay. Let's see, multinational corporations. We read about this, right? We read about uh, colonialism and how it was motivated by money. So the newspaper covers a lot about what about Jeff Bezos and Amazon? What about Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg? So these are all interesting debates we have about business leaders and the centralization of wealth. Um, All right, political leaders deal with national security. The good leaders use diplomacy and intelligence and the military. But first you try to come to a diplomatic solution, but you don't trust the person you're negotiating with. You also have intelligence to know if they're telling you the truth. Otherwise, of course, any sort of, uh, a treaty or agreement would expose you, right? You'd be getting used. So you have to have intelligence, but, and then if that doesn't work, 
you go with the military. But you shouldn't, you know, think that military solutions solve anything. Because one of the themes in Homer, which I think is a theme in history, is that war doesn't solve things. Wars can be won or lost, but they usually leave behind a lot of bad blood, a lot of animosity. Um, it depends upon how the treaties um, play out after a war, but just trying to win, just trying to use violence, it just doesn't work over time. Um, there actually is empirical evidence about that too, that over time, uh, there were studies, empirical studies about conflicts that were resolved through nonviolent demonstrations, negotiation versus violence. And the nonviolent ones, 10 years later, the country was more stable, which is intuitively obvious. So it is important to know that valuing diplomacy over military is not naive. And it's not, it doesn't fail. It just has to be done really carefully. Um, even tempered, it's important to know when to be angry as a leader. Um, most people get angry too soon. So to be a good leader, you would tend to not get angry even when most people would. Um, give employees a, a way to express what frustrates them anonymously or publicly. Um, a sense of humor, uh, friendship, creating bonds between workers. This is really important. If people come to work and they feel connected to the people at work, they feel part of a community, they will. I mean, they'll help each other out. You'll be a lot more productive and a lot more efficient. Um, the more specialized we get, the more complex our societies get, the more interdependent we get. So we really have to trust each other. And so we have to become trustworthy. Um, there's so many ways that this can get abused. Um, let's see, older workers, the relation between the generations. So the younger generations are much better at the technology. The older generations, though, you know, have things to offer. Um, so the more they can work together and respect each other. And, you know, the younger generation is going to replace the older generation. So whatever insights they have, they provide it and they move on. They don't try to keep power long after they are able to exercise it within the context of a changing culture. Um, sociability, how, did, how that works out in a company, rational pride, do you have an honor day? You make sure to honor people that have did, done more for the organization than they needed to. Um, you reward workers who really want to learn at work and take extra classes or go to seminars, you know, show initiative that they wanna keep learning. Um, High-mindedness, that's really important, not to be petty or mean-spirited. And then to know yourself as a leader, to admit what you know and don't know, to consult experts. Um, all right making good rules and regulations within a company, applying them fairly, enforcing them equally, right? You don't, you know, the higher ups, the <clears throat> managers don't get to get off more lightly than the workers. Um, all of that stuff is important. Let's see, in relation to government, your goal isn't just to not pay taxes. This is what Jeff Bezos, and uh, Zuckerberg, they also try desperately not to pay taxes. General Electric, it's just terrible. Um, and they have uh, bribed politicians, paid for their political campaigns, and the politicians vote 
to cut their taxes, cut their personal taxes, cut their corporate taxes. Um, and it's causing a lot of problems throughout the world. Um, you could pay someone to keep track about the legislation. Uh, somebody's microphone is on. Kasturi, is that yours? Um, oh, sorry, Professor. Okay. So, and the conclusion is that on the one hand, you know, everything looks different. Are these, um, is this way of looking at things, these kind of patterns, are they universal um, or not, right? And I'm open, you know, I don't, I just make a suggestion. Here's one way to look at the patterns so that we could all be on the same page in terms of a, uh, how to know that we're talking about the same subject, right? How to actually have debates, um, other than just saying it's all relative, everybody's situation is different. Um, and I, okay, so, so that was the conclusion is that it's possible to have some sort of common ground from which you start debating. So that was the idea. So um, I am gonna put you into groups. And again, I wanna make sure somebody is the leader who hasn't done it before. And they, first of all, they start out with their own comments. And the first comment should be the ones they brought with them, right? What they wanted to say, what they prepared, because that's what struck them. That's what they learned the most. And then, you know, anything else that came up while I was summarizing the paper. So somebody needs to take the initiative that hasn't done it before, start with what they came with or what they reacted to, and then make sure other people can, of course, ask questions. But make sure by the end of the time, um, I'll give you 15 minutes. If you finish before that, come back into the big, the main room. If you don't, I will check on you after 15 minutes and if you need more time. So I'm hoping that by this point in the class, you will start having enough to say. I mean, I'm, it should be building on itself, okay? So um, I'm gonna, okay, so I guess, um, what I'm going to have to do from now on, just because there just aren't enough people talking, is literally, we will all meet together, and I will call your name. And if, if you don't say anything, I am going to grade you down. So class participation is going to count for part of your grade. I don't want to do this, but here I have... I have students from all over the world. They could bring all sorts of examples. It could be a wonderful class, but one third of the students participate. So I am going to punish you, <laughs> right? You know, like I tried to motivate you. And so it's just like I'm running something, right? I'm a manager. Uh, so now it's got to be fear, right? The carrot versus the stick. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple more of the readings. Um, and then I'm going to call on each of you. And I will come, you know, I will grade you. I have said enough just during the class for you to have something to say. So there's just no reason not to have something to say. Okay. So the other um, attachments that I had were, I went back to the reading you had last time and the outline here. Now, the, and this should be important for every one of you because 
I don't think any of you want to live in an authoritarian society, but um, lessons learned, right? And, and you do know that America was set up to be a constitutional government, the rule of law. And in Athens, Athens lost its democracy because everyone was corrupt and because the Athenians let themselves get manipulated by greedy, power-hungry people. So our, the founders of America had read about the Greeks. They knew Plato, they knew Aristotle. They were very worried that the people in the US were not educated. They needed to be educated. They even started schools where they read Plato and Aristotle and Greek tragedy and all sorts of stuff as a way to get the citizens to get engaged. Um, so one comment any of you could make is do you think there's a problem with political leaders who use rhetoric to manipulate the public so that people think that they care about them they, they're ruling for the sake of the world and they're really not. All they care about is helping their friends, harming their enemies, getting richer, getting more powerful, right? Every one of you, you can think of an example in your own country. Um, now, the necessity for virtue. This guy says we need virtue. What is it? It's the capacity to get over your self-interest and think of the common good. So I'm gonna ask each of you, give me an example of some way that you think about something where you think a good policy, what should be done or a good law would be good because everyone would benefit even if I personally would not benefit, okay? You have to think about that, all right. Um, if you just pursue your private interests, everything will fall apart. If every student at AUW just used their education to get rich, not to promote the good of their country, that would be really a, a waste of the donor's money because the donors are donating money under the assumption that the students will use their education to help their countries. It's the same with Lion students. If, you know, we have rich donors, they aren't giving money to the school and scholarships so kids can take the system and get as rich as possible. They're giving the money so that the students will develop skills and use them for the benefit of other citizens and we will preserve our democracy in the US and in those other countries, you will prevent even more instability, but you will become more democratic. You will move toward more informed citizens and a higher quality of life. All right, so um, let's see, let me go to the last paragraph, which I thought was really amazing. This is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian. He says that, um, he asks, what are our common beliefs? And he says, no one creed is able to encompass the diverse backgrounds and values of American students. Well, I think that's crazy because Aristotle's classical virtues are, um, do encompass all of our values. So I don't understand why he thinks that. Um, and it worries me quite a bit because if a historian can't explain, you know, what would be practical wisdom, can't, you know, use some kind of model like Aristotle, like <laughs> who can? And our country is really in trouble because we can't find any sort of common ground. And I think it's right there in front of our face. But, and then the rest of the semester, I will also link that to Jesus and Confucius and Buddha and 
Martin Luther King and these other people so that you can see that, yeah, there is a common ground. There's no reason not to be able to deliberate on the basis of a common ground. Um, all right, so there's that. And so another thing, when I call on each of you, you could say, do you think there's a common ground? Do you think you could get in a conversation with someone in another country about political leadership in your country and you could find that the things that you admire or the things that you criticize are very similar in terms of is the leader ruling for the benefit of the ruled or not? Okay, then this article, everyone's a change maker and it's about that students now who want to um, succeed are going to be able to think in these broader ways. Uh, for millennials, most people's lives. Okay, so previously people just learned a skill and then imitated somebody, they would go with an apprentice or something, but that's not the way it is anymore. I'm sorry about the way they block this out. But anyway, you can, you can get what he's trying to say. There's a new sort of person that recognizes patterns, identifies an issue, a problem, can organize teams and deal with situations as they arise, right? You're flexible, you're adaptable. Um, and so to form and lead a community of communities. Um, so it gives you need cognitive empathy-based living for the good of all. Well, hello, <laughs> that's what we're talking about, is that goodwill and trust. People have goodwill for each other. Um, you have empathy. And this, we will see this again when we study Jesus and Confucius and Buddha and all these people. Uh, Socrates, right, was the first one. It's um, how people are feeling and then you're able to get people linked and try to figure out how to rule for the sake of the rules. Um, uh, let's see. So this is what needs to be cultivated. This is what I think I try to cultivate in my class. Um, so, and he says, let's start with the kid age 12. So you guys, you're a lot older than 12. So you identify some problem. Maybe the kids are mean to the special needs students, right? But you can identify any problem you want. Then, is there anything you can do about it to solve the problem, right? Okay, now, how do you solve a problem? Um, then you take initiative and you organize your friends, um, put the kids in charge. So that's what I try to do in my classes, right? Put the students in charge. I give them something to read. They don't need to, you know, they need to take it run with it, uh, recognize a pattern, apply it, talk to each other about how each other applied it. If we have students from all different countries, you should be able to build a team within this international context. So I do want you to be able to do this kind of thinking. Um, and it's, I don't know if change maker is just the best word. It's just someone who's adapted to the cultural world that you have to function in. That is a changed world, but um, you need universal literacy. Um, you need to be able to think um, in terms of international problems. So again, I don't, I don't think Aristotle is the only way or that it's complete or that there aren't problems, but I'm just introducing that for starters, right? And, um, and it's, it's a way to get people on the same page and then to start deliberating, talking about whether that works in this situation or not. Um, okay. 
All right, social transformation. Um, I don't, again, you're, you're not necessarily transforming the society. You're literally adapting to a society that's changing rapidly, especially since COVID. Of course, this was written before COVID. So I personally think COVID has speeded up a whole lot of things that were in the background before that. And I'm not the only person who thinks that. It's just that, okay, climate change was always a problem and now it's just ratcheting up. Pandemics, the economic, the interconnections of our economic system, the way that what people in one place do affects what everybody else does. Um, so, the, I mean, you know, America could be much better in terms of the uh, COVID problem, the Delta variant, if we had all gotten vaccinated before. All right, now, wh whether you believe in it or not, it's a fact that Americans could have gotten it and they would be less sick and there would be more vaccines to send to developing countries. All that is, is there's an impact. Everything you do has an impact. And um, so just being very aware of that is important. And then, so I think this way of thinking is what you absolutely need to do to, to function in the world you're going into. Now, if we don't get to everybody, I am gonna call on you next time. And from now on, I'm going to call on you every day, so you must come prepared, okay? Nobody is silent or else, you know, they get a zero for the day on participation. Let's see, so, um, all right, uh, Liam, some comment on something I've said that matters to you. So, I did hear my name. I hope you said my name. Otherwise, it's kind of awkward. Um, I'm going to go on to the um, public figures thing because it kind of drew, that's a thing that I talked about a lot in high school. Um, modern political campaigns are founded upon the basis of marketing rather than like actual substance of the campaign. Um, so candidates will spend a lot more time building a brand and an image rather than actually like speaking of the policy. Uh, that's especially uh, not relevant, but like obvious in uh, news sources because they'll focus on buzzwords and like uh, it'll seem more like a tabloid than it actually is a political campaign. Um, and if you compare that to like British politics where they have a specified amount of airtime and every, uh, what is it? Every candidate is viewed upon equally in the way of time or at least given a minimum amount of time, regardless of who they are, there's so much so that there's even like an entire satirical candidate that runs just about every election cycle for prime minister called Lord Benface. And it's great. If you don't know what that is, please look it up. He's amazing. Um, but it's, it, it's more, or modern politics are more of manipulating the public than doing any good. Okay, uh, the British also have the BBC, which they established a long time ago. So it's news that's not profit driven. Yeah. Right? That's really, really important. Yeah. Uh, we have public radio and public stuff, but most of the public doesn't listen to it. NPR is where it's at, best place. Okay, I have a friend who started one of the first stations. But okay, um, Kasturi, what do you think? Uh, so, Professor, I think that uh, change makers are important person in the uh, in any of the uh, place that we exist. So, uh, I'm not really sure about the political situation that was in the past because. Uh, uh, through the readings that I went through and through the new stuff that I heard, uh, I, I got to know that uh, Nepal was ruled by autocratic rulers called Ranas in Nepal. They were cruel, uh, but then 
Uh, I think Who is that. Child? I think that uh, uh, we cannot compare their personal virtues with political virtues as well, because uh, some of the leaders, they were really good because they were the ones who uh, actually started uh, health facilities and education in Nepal. So uh, although they are not in existence anymore, uh, there are institutions that uh, were actually established by them. So I think they were the change makers in the history of Nepal who actually um, provided the opportunity to educate females. Uh, so in the uh, few, year, uh, few years back, females in Nepal, they were not provided with the opportunity to educate themselves, but then uh, there were the uh, leaders who actually established colleges and universities for women. Uh, there is a there is a college called Padma Kanya College, uh, which was uh, established by the leader called Padma Shamser. And Kanya means uh, girls in Nepal. So uh, he basically established that uh, educational foundation for educating females. Uh, it is obvious that uh, uh, in the initial phase, those institutions uh, were prioritized for uh, females who belonged to the royal families but then uh, now uh, the royal family is is not more in existence we don't have monarchy system at the present but then uh, <clears throat> although they sort of educating their families and relatives uh, during their rule in the country but i think that uh, that thing eventually uh, assisted in uh, educating uh, normal citizens at present so i think that a uh, small step uh, initiated by us can actually help change the situation that uh, people around us are going through okay good so another point i want to make is that you can use this framework to evaluate leaders in the past and to try to learn the lessons of history, right? So um, yeah, a, yes. yeah, a leader might have made a lot of good decisions and then they made one bad decision. And, you know, it's to me, it's just common sense, but it's just constantly training yourself how to learn, right? How to learn. Yeah. Okay. I, I personally, I also personally think that uh, no one is perfect in this world. So even though uh, an individual has a very good virtues, uh, he or she will have at least one negative virtue as well. So I think that um, in order to be content and happy, we should be looking at the positive aspects that relies in people. Well, also, you should talk to people you know and say, I think that's your weakness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so if we, we talk to them, they can change. That's right. And that's really important. Okay, Nahida, what have you got? Okay, Nahida, is your microphone work or... Mm -hmm. I really uh, support Kasturi's opinion. Uh, and I liked her example as well, Maple's dictatorship. I personally don't think anything, but I, I am listening everyone attention, with that full okay, attention. So Nahida, next time you need to come with your own example, okay? Okay, Professor. Okay. Um, Blaine. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, uh, I, so like, are you wanting me to just say like something that I liked about what you said and then add some anecdotal stuff to it? Or are you wanting me to uh, say like what I, what I had in my, my post, the three things? You should say what you think, what you had in your post. Okay. Um, so I have a question about Aristotle, one of the things that I wanted to talk about. So a lot of the virtues that were listed in the documents on the Google Classroom post, like they, it talks about the virtues and one overarching thing that I saw with all of them was that they had something to do with um, like the human controlling him or herself to do or not do something. So self-control is a really big thing for him 
So did Aristotle have the view that humans are imperfect from birth and that we're evil by nature? No, he thought we're neither good nor evil by nature, but it's culture and habit that, that determine or that either help people to actually flourish if you get good habits and prevent them from flourishing if you get bad habits, but you're always responsible. By the time you're an adult, you're responsible for knowing what's better and worse. And then if you were poorly habituated, you're gonna to have to fight against your desires. If you were well habituated, you're gonna desire what's right, and then you're gonna get knowledgeable and you can have integrity. Does that make sense, Blaine? I mean, mm -hmm. You're not yeah. born virtuous or vicious, but there is a healthy way to get habituated and there's an unhealthy way to get habituated. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Um, is it that we have to have, yes, you do have to have self-knowledge. Well, it's just, you have to know why, right? You have to, um, like your parents make you eat vegetables. Oh, I hated eating vegetables. And then you get to college and you find out why they made you eat vegetables. And you know, you can not eat vegetables, but you're not gonna be healthy. But, but if you do, you do it because it's the right thing. You don't do it because your parents told you to, right? Does that make sense? So they gave you good habits, but then you have to take ownership for your choices. You become aware of the power of choice and then you start to commit to making choices that follow the truth, right? And it's imprecise. I mean, you can eat a lot of different ways and still come out having eaten pretty healthy by the end of the day. It's just, there's definitely things that are not healthy. <laughs> All right, so Samantha, what do you think? I, when we were talking about, is it, uh, is there a way to bring people together and find a middle ground? I truly believe that certain issues you can find a middle ground on. I think there are other issues that is a lot harder to find that middle ground on. And I think it's just within human nature. People like to travel in packs. And when they find a pack, it's very difficult to people to go outside that pack or step outside of what they know or what they view. And so I think that you can kind of push them out a little bit, but they'll always come back to their box or to their tribe. And so I think you can find a great in a, a middle, a great area or a middle ground. But I think it all comes back to who really is in power and how the people in power view issues and if it will benefit them or not. And so I think it's not necessarily difficult for everyday citizens to have a big say in government. But I think it's a lot harder than many people think. Well, it's also true that in this creating of a brand image, like Liam said, fear is appealed to, like really close to the brainstem kind of fear. And um, like fear of immigrants, right? Fear of the other. Um, they're going to take away our country, whatever. And this is true in other countries too, it's not just our country, but people just have to be self-aware that they're getting manipulated. Um, does that make sense, Samantha? Like if people don't self-correct, you don't have democracy, you're gonna lose it. Does that make sense? Oh no, I 100% agree. I think at least from what I've seen, especially with the use of the internet and social media, you see it a lot among younger kids on the internet basically just jumping on trends or basically screaming at people on the internet. And you know, they're like 11, 12 years old um, with certain topics. And I guess you could say that manipulation tactics are still the same as they once used to be, but they're being used on a wider scale and people are being educated about these certain topics. And I think that it's safe to say that, um, I think it's if Americans and any really anywhere else around the world, if people start realizing or start thinking about everything that they hear and see, that it could possibly be used as a narrative, it would benefit a lot of people. I think it would bring people from the both extremes of both sides 
more towards the middle. And I think it would allow people to start seeing each other as human beings and not monsters. Okay, very good. That's a great way to end the class. Okay, so next time I want everybody to pick up because truly the students I have at Lyon and at AUW are going to be the change makers. They are going to be the leaders. They get a liberal education. That's, you know, the people who provide the opportunity are entrusting you to do this, right? To be the person who points the stuff out, who doesn't give in, who finds the common ground and that preserves democracy or avoids authoritarianism. So I gotta let you go, but I think maybe it works better if we just all hang together. Uh, I don't know for what reason, but um, we'll do that at least for a while until everybody knows that they're gonna be on the spot. Okay, I'll see you. Um, we're reading Martin Luther King next time. So um, uh, I will stay here if people want to talk about their papers.